Welcome to the Journey of the Universe 10 Years Later podcast series. My name is Sam King, and I'm fortunate to be hosting discussions with a number of educators, artists, and activists whose work draws on the inspiration of deep time and the Journey of the Universe film. Today, I'm fortunate to be speaking with Tom Collins, a longtime educator who has taught the universe story at a variety of American high schools. 10 years ago, he joined Mary Evelyn Tucker for a wide ranging discussion about his impact on students. And today I'm excited to continue the conversation on envisioning the future of education in light of the universe story. Welcome, Tom. Hey, Sam. <laughs> Tom, could you tell us um, a little bit about how you became interested in the universe story over the course of your educational journey? Um, my involvement with the universe story really started <clears throat> with my involvement with religion and ecology. I was in graduate school and back in graduate school and learned from one of my professors who had gotten back from the Harvard conference on Hinduism and ecology about this program going on. And I had been working with trying to arrange summer seminars for teachers of religion in schools to kind of upgrade their knowledge. And that led me to call John and Mary Evelyn. <clears throat> and that led to conversation that led to uh, doing some seminars during the summer at Bucknell. And from there, that led to a kind of growing awareness of what they were doing with the universe story. And um, so, do you know, time and reading um, and an awareness of how important this was led me to begin to offer courses in the universe story itself. Amazing, amazing. And what was the sort of early iteration of your course? How did you start bringing this sort of integral perspective of narrative storytelling into the classroom? Well, I was, I was lucky in that I had, I had had some time thinking about it and thinking about religion and ecology and thinking about this, mm -hmm. that kind of coincided where I was asked to create a religious studies department in an independent school, which coincided with in creating a course that had interdisciplinary credit. So students could take the course for either science credit or history credit or religion credit. And that was perfect in terms of, of then being able to draw students from various disciplines. Time the school was uh, bringing Harkness pedagogy into the classroom, and we were thinking about team teaching. So all of that, all of that worked together um, to create this really wonderful, wonderful beginning. Awesome. For those of um, for those listening that may not be familiar, can you explain what the Harkness method is and how you drew on yeah. that to, over the course of you know teaching the universe story? Yeah, yeah. Um, Harkness was a pedagogy kind of developed uh, in the 1930s, I think, late 20s or early 30s, mm -hmm. um, by a man named Edward Harkness who had this money, and he said to several of the schools. The independent schools, New England independent schools, you know, I want you to come up with something different than just kind of straightforward lecture. And something that really is innovative and new and radical. And what they came up with was students around a table where the focus on learning was on the student, that the student was responsible for asking the questions for talking to each other, for their own learning. And it became radical and revolutionary in terms of really pushing students to take responsibility for their own learning and to move away from the kind of teacher as the source of knowledge to the students as the source of knowledge. Um, and, um, and again, responsible for their own learning. And it, it um, it's, was wonderful and radical, and I've continued to find it um, to be an excellent way to teach. And I recognize that 
you know, teaching about deep time and the story of the universe, yeah. none, of us, none of us are experts on the entire story. And some of the scientific ideas are extremely abstruse and difficult to, to grasp uh, for an adult and certainly for, for an adolescent. So how did, how did you go about um, conveying these really <coughs> difficult ideas like, you know, the, the great flaring forth or the emergence of stars, the explosion of supernova and formation of galaxies? How, how did you convey that in a way that was um, accept, not just accessible, but engaging and inspiring for, for young people? Well, you know, it, the, the, some, of the, some of the awe and wonder is just built into the material itself, mm -hmm. right? And the point you're making, it seems to me, is that, you know, on one level, everybody can grasp, like, you know, stars explode, right? Mm -hmm. And they send, you know, chemical elements out into the universe, right? Mm -hmm. But then there's another level below that <laughs> that's thinking about what is that seeding effect? Mm. And those are questions of implication and meaning and a, and a larger picture of a kind of um, unfolding mm. that are harder to get to. Mm -hmm. I, I, think, I think students get that at a certain level, right? But then it becomes hard for them to... Um, to go to a certain depth, to go even deeper, and to hold even deeper when they've got four other subjects and they're doing college admissions and there's all this, you know, all of that stuff. You know, Sam, some of the most profound, I would say that, that some of the most profound experiences was with them was really doing on the local level and nature writing amazing you know is, is that that was in some ways more accessible mm -hmm. yeah i know um in a way that the kind of um rhythmic tones of nature writing and they're and then going out into the woods and spending time and doing things and mm -hmm. taking canoe trips or going snorkeling in the park or you know whatever was more effective because it was more immediate. I mean, and um, we would do things. I mean, one very important exercise was doing this kind of, you know, cosmic walk, mm -hmm. which was very helpful. But it's still, even if you do all of that, you know, I think you have to go again and again and again and again and again. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. like, it's like, um, let's take photosynthesis, right? Mm -hmm. And you go like photosynthesis mm -hmm. <laughs> and you explain, you know, you, you, you come to kind of understand that that means for the first time that life is taking energy directly from the sun, eating the sun, eating light and creating growth and more life. Well, you know, you can go like, oh, okay, click, check. <laughs> and then you can also go like, what? <laughs> you know, uh, that's unbelievable. Right. You know, what mystery is this? Right. right. And a, a question that's often not raised in a conventional science class, right? No, I mean, that's right. They have the problem. They certainly will talk about it. Mm. And they certainly will talk about how cool it is. Mm. But to really think about um, there's still a mystery there. You know, even if we can explain mm -hmm. all of the parts of it and what happened, it's still unbelievable. Absolutely. It's still, there. there's a mystery and awe there still. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think leading with that sense of awe is so, so uh, formative for students. I mean, I think about that insight from the Journey film about how in the last four billion years, the sun has uh, grown about 25 percent hotter, but the earth has evolved to, to 
maintain a, a narrow band of temperature conducive to life. I mean, it's just, it's astounding. Um, or and, cosmic expansion. Absolutely. You know, if the, if faster or slower, what would have happened? And the fraction, you know, the, the small difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, and um, how, do you, how do you slow down enough in the midst of a busy school schedule and you mentioned you were teaching this course for a year. Um, so you, you know, you had enough latitude, I, I hope, you know, to, to do this kind of reflection, but how do you, how do you create those kind of learning spaces for students? Um, it, so they're not just on to the next thing, or they're not just learning about photosynthesis and trying to, um, well, and I, I even test. Yeah. And the question is really, what was I trying to get them to understand? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Sure. So, um, you know, what I would say that what I was trying to get them to understand is that um, we live in a story. Hmm. We've always lived in a story. Hmm. The story is changing. Science, science has become the basis of a new story. So therefore, you know, studying myth and then doing the cosmology of the old stories. And what are the old stories saying? So, you know, deconstructing, you know, the two Genesis stories, looking at Plato's Timaeus, you know, reading, you know, Rosemary Ruther and what she has to say about those stories. The fact that they have social and moral and ethical implications as well. You know, the stories affect us in a variety of ways. Then moving on to the scientific revolution, you know, what happened? How did, how did our vision of the world change? What did it take? How do worldviews change? And then looking at, looking at all of that, before we even got into what the new cosmology is. Right. Wow. So you're saying you started off these courses with um, questions of narrative, questions of worldview, and sort of um, studying these ancient mythologies from the world's world. And, and then studying the scientific revolution. Absolutely. You know, what did it mean to discover the age of the earth? And how did that happen? And about mm -hmm. Darwin and about, you know, because mm -hmm. what's central to the story is also evolution. And how all those pieces converge. Mm -hmm. So that, that might have been four months before I even got to the new cosmology. Wow. Right? Or yeah. I even got to it. Yeah. You know, laying the groundwork in terms of mm -hmm. the importance of stories, how the story has changed, and, and how long it takes the story to change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and right? you, am I hearing you say that you were, you were embedding reflection throughout this year? Right. So as you're sure. learning about these, you know, about the Genesis stories and, uh, uh, you know, other myth mythological accounts, I know you've used indigenous, you know, cosmo visions and, and um, origin stories um, in some of your classes. And, you know, it's interesting to hear the ways you've brought in reflection throughout both those sort of humanitarian insights and then as well in the advent of the great flaring forth and the other scientific paradigms. Yeah. Um, before I even got to that, I mean, like, they would write an analysis of the two Genesis stories. What is it saying about our relationship with the earth? Mm, mm. What is it saying about our role as humans? Mm. You know, or, and, and including like little selections from the Timaeus. What is it saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is Rosemary Ruther right or wrong? You know, so they're, they're analyzing and, and to analyze, they have to reflect, right? Absolutely. Because of this, I think this, right? Yeah. yeah, well, what, what technological advances seem to you to be the most important and why? Mm. Mm. You know, science and technology always go together. Right. Right. You know, math is the language of science. Right. The high language of science. Mm. Mm. Right. Yeah. You couldn't do any of this without calculus, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm, 
Uh, I'm pivoting a little bit. I'm interested as well in how this sort of integral approach to teaching was received both by, so let's start with by students before we talk about teachers and administrators. You know, how did this more holistic approach to, to, to teaching yeah. resonate with students, you know, based on their own yeah, personal the students, the students often would go through a period of being angry. <laughs> they would feel angry about not always being taught this way. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, because they were learning different things from different angles and putting them together and, you know, science and history and philosophy and ethics and, you know, religion. Mm -hmm. Big questions. You know, they were tackling big questions. Why did the scientific revolution happen? What is the power of stories? Mm -hmm. What is our attitude towards nature? How did we get that attitude? Mm -hmm. How does change happen? You know, they loved that mm -hmm. and felt angry that then they hadn't had more of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's amazing to see the way um, I've, I've used Journey of the Universe with high school students as well, as we've discussed, Tom, and it's amazing to see how the dots connect or how the stars yeah. align for, yeah. for students when you're weaving together the great questions of philosophy and religious studies with the insights of modern scientific cosmology, because I think and history, yeah, yeah, right, absolutely, because it, it's so often presented as this sort of disparate, as disparate areas of inquiry, and for students, it's so often you know these different fields become you know an exercise you do toward a test or toward some extrinsic outcome rather than um, an intrinsic wellspring of knowledge that's intimately interwoven, as the journey project uh, shows. Yeah. You know, one of, one of the things that was great about Lawrenceville, Sam, when we did interdisciplinary stuff, we yeah, had yeah. to use the methodology. We had to outline what methodology we were going to use with each discipline. Uh -huh. So when we did history, I had to, you know, we had specific historical methodology. So we weren't giving that up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. As we were saying, it's part of something else. We weren't saying it's all the same. Uh -huh. But we were looking at it in a bigger framework, right. or religion, or science. Like I said, my best teachers have been my smartest teacher. I mean, this is the kind of person who could go home and, like, learn a new language over the weekend. I'm, I'm not kidding, Sam. I mean, that kind of person. Yeah. Always explained things simply. Hmm. It wasn't convoluted you know, lots of technical vocabulary. Hmm. Hmm. Buddhist philosophy, you know, and it, it was like, oh, you know, anybody could understand. And I think that's true of, of good minds, right? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's something I appreciate about the simplification, uh, the simplicity of some of the scientific uh, summaries uh -huh. of, the, uh -huh. of the journey of the universe curriculum, which is available on the website, is these fairly streamlined summaries of a particular cosmic paradigm. Like, here is what we know about the emergence of the f first prokaryote, likely in a yeah. geothermal yeah. vent in the deep yeah. ocean. Yeah. Um, and obviously, there's infinitely more complexity Behind yeah. those uh, those those insights, but I, I find that powerful as a starting point. Right here is oh, what we know, totally. and then students totally. always go deeper into into these different, you know, these profound, you know, transformations. Yeah, yeah. I have found that too. Listening, I mean, listening to Ursula Good now, right? Uh -huh. You know, she does the same thing. Of course. And she could go on and on and on and on and on. Right. But when she's doing a public lecture or talking to people, she explains from her vast repertoire of knowledge, you know, the kind of basics where you understand it. Right, right. And that's that. where it should be. That's right. Yeah, I love that idea that, you know, cells have a sense of primitive discernment, she says, right? And what that means, you know, in terms of sentience and subjectivity are, you know, infinitely complex questions, but um, I, I so appreciate as well the sort of those simple in, invitations by an expert like, you know, Ursula Goodenough yeah. 
and it's not simplistic, right? It's the, there's a difference between simple and simplistic, right? They're not being simplistic. Great point. They're, they're being very profound, but it's simple statements, uh -huh. right? Yeah, that's it's a really really great point, Tom. Um, yeah, and you know I'd like to 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 move a little bit toward thinking about the future of education, and yeah. I know you and I have talked at length about these questions, but you know, as you reflect back on your decades of teaching at a variety of schools and, you know, all the students you've worked with, I know you've, you've taken students to India, you, you said you've done all these experiential learning exercises, taking students snorkeling in Florida, and doing a lot of place-based learning. How do you see the future of education and particularly in this historical moment, you know, in this, in the Anthropocene, in light of climate change, in light of all the um, you know, systemic racism, all the social justice crises that we're facing. Like, what, um, what do you, yeah, what's your outlook for the future of education? Well, I, you know, um, what, what we know from sociology is that education is instinctively conservative. In this sense, meaning it doesn't make change quickly. That part of its purpose is to socialize another generation. Um, and I think that the time, I, I think we don't, I don't think we can wait for that. What I, you know, if I were 30 years younger, you know, I would, I would try and figure out how to do a school. Um, and my background is high school. I let somebody else figure out about middle school and elementary school. And there are others, I think, who are doing some good work with elementary and middle school, right? Mm -hmm. um, that would be a kind of integrated education in high school where they would get the kind of pieces of what they need for college requirement, but to do it in a more integrated way that would touch on all the things that you mentioned in a way that would hopefully help the students feel more knowledgeable about the world around them, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and themselves, and themselves in that world. You know, that old Confucian model that Mary Evelyn talks about, right? That mm -hmm. connection between heaven, humanity, and, and yourself, right? right. And um, because we are connected. So it's, 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 it's you and, and the world around you that includes your family and your kin and the stories there and your local, you know, z you know, ecological zone, but also the world. And that would include all the particulars, but, but done in a different way. I mean, you know, the way that, that language and math and science are taught a little differently. But are you, are you thinking that at ninth grade, students should be introduced to the story of the universe, you know, as a, you know, a new high And I think groundwork. I think groundwork for sure. Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. I also think you don't just do it once. Right. <laughs> you know, if you, if you mention something, you don't, there's no rule that you have to, that you just can do it once. Mm-hmm. I think at the ninth grade, you're, you know, you're teaching them the beginnings of critical thinking. It's really about skill at the ninth grade. Absolutely. It, yeah. It's about, it's about the beginning of critical thinking, evaluation of resources, yep. you know, in our um, society point of view, mm -hmm. you know, the big, the big problem now is you can see how everyone thinks that are, there's such a danger that all opinions are the same. Mm -hmm. And they're not. They're not. We confuse the right to have an opinion versus the content of one. Right. 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 <laughs> and I, th I think, you know, with the Internet and all of what's going on, we, we've got to help them with that. You know, it's like so-and-so may think, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, Jewish lasers from space or firing on earth and setting up forest fires. But um, that doesn't mean it's true. 
And I, I think um, there are ways to begin to teach them how to really uh, see that mm. and to see that, and also to help. Um, I don't think, I don't think also your education is something that's made to make you feel good. Mm. It's not about making you feel good. Mm. It's not another commodity like Baskin Robbins ice cream. Mm. Now, we have to be sensitive to when students are uncomfortable. We have to help them through that, but we don't avoid that. Right. The nature of learning, I mean, it was my nature in college. <laughs> I went back 30 years old. I'd come home sometimes and throw the book across the room. It'd make me so mad. But I think that's part of learning. Absolutely. Yeah, I had a, a college professor who said, being educated is uncomfortable. You know? That's right. And sort of, you know, the culmination of the universe story and thinking about the Anthropocene and the environmental crises we face, it's certainly not, you know, joyful stuff for, for well, most people. So, um, but you know, doing that in a way that's compassionate and mindful and sort of age appropriate is, I think, you know, a, a great opportunity, you know, and thing for us. Well, and you were asking the students also would, would hit moments of despair, Sam. Mm -hmm. You know, they would hit moments of despair and mm -hmm. having things they could do as they read about the sixth extinction, and, you know, trying to figure out that there were things that they could do that they might be, you know, ways to yeah. generate hope, ways to do something. Right, right. And that's as real as it gets and very important. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I know, you know, Joanna Macy writes so eloquently about yeah. finding joy and, and, um, and meaning in the midst of despair and sort of holding both of those, those qualities, you know, together. Um, and I guess maybe that's a good sort of uh, point for us to, to wrap things up on Tom, like how, cause I know you and I are both interested in imbuing education with meaning and purpose and, sense of wonder, right, that we want to embed into, into the subjects we're teaching. Um, how do you, you know, how do you introduce, you know, curriculum that's, that's, that's difficult, that can sometimes give rise to despair, but also um, sort of help evoke this sense of wonder and, and meaning for students? Well, I think the curriculum, I mean, I think the parts of the universe story do that itself, mm. right? I don't think you have to work to evoke the wonder. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, as you begin to ask, like, what does that mean? Mm. What does that say to you? I think when you're there, the moments of despair, I think you, you, you just honor by saying to them, like, you know, you might have a hard time with this. Right. If you do, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it as a group, right? right. You know, um, but also um, they will they will get to those places on their own. They really will. Then they will, um, particularly if you're leaving room for it. I don't think you have to work to get them to feel wonder. I think you have to make room for them so that they can you know, they're not used to talking about wonder in most of their classrooms. <laughs> so you have to make a space where they, they know that vocabulary is okay. And I, I, I love that idea, Tom, that the universe itself is imbuing wonder through, yeah. you know, when you learn about the ways in which the explosion of a supernova creates the elements we find on earth, right? That's right. Um, or, you know, the, yeah, that first emergence of a prokaryotic cell, right? And yes. it, right? That moment where uh, <laughs> the stuff of life takes on, you know, that, yeah, that, that a sense of interiority, right? A sense of cool. uh, complexification. Um, I mean, what a, what a profound um, insight. Uh, for well, us. Just to sit with, the, that's right, going on those same statements. You know, ultimately, our ancestors are the stars. Mm. Yeah. Like the poet said, you know, we are stardust. Well, turns out to be true. Yeah. <laughs> not only, right? Not only, yeah. but we are stardust. That's right. That's right. 
And I think you and I both share that, that, you know, that the sense of remembering where we come from and remembering our ultimate destiny in the stars perhaps will help us, you know, to re-envision and sort of re re-inspire some of the ways we do our teaching in the future. You know, one can only hope. Tom, just wanted to thank you for joining me today for this discussion, for sharing your, your wealth of insights, you know, from your decades of teaching and yeah, for all the inspiration that you've given me as an aspiring educator. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm wishing you well um, in, in your next horizons. Thank you, Sam. Alrighty. Look forward to, to connecting again soon. More conversation. Absolutely.